The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. I've got a special treat for you today. This video that we're going to share with you is the very first video we ever did at Streamline Art Video. I went to the legend, Max Ginsberg, and talked him into doing this with me, and so you're going to get a little piece of that now. It's called Legacy of an American Painter with Max Ginsberg. I'm going to do a portrait today, a head study, and the uh, first thing that I want to do is lay out the palette, and I'll explain what I'm doing, and then I'm going to pose the model in a certain position so I'll have the kind of design and expression that I want. So the first thing is uh, I'm using a French easel here, and I brought several uh, uh, canvases. This is just a canvas, a white canvas, that I stretched the other day in case I was going to use that. Uh, and this is a uh, masonite panel where uh, I had a painting underneath. A lot of paintings I do that I don't care for, I just scrape down, sand down, and paint over uh, so I have a more neutral surface. And then I start painting on this. I'm going to lay out the paint uh, and I'll explain what I'm doing and then I'm going to pose the model and talk about posing the model and the design involved. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put the paint down and talk about the colors that I use. Uh, the, palette, the palette that I'm using is essentially the color layout that my father uh, taught me. Uh, he was a portrait painter who studied at the National Academy of Design in 1920. And, and he laid out a palette like this. He had some famous teachers there like uh, Hawthorne um, who was one of his teachers and, um, and anyhow he, my, my father would paint with this palette and this is essentially what I'm using now. Over the years, I've changed colors. And I also want to say that uh, different artists use different arrangements of colors. Uh, some even use only four colors. But I tend to use the full palette that uh, I have been using for a long time. Well, the black I just laid out was Mars black. And the... Um, the, the, uh, this dark blue was ultramarine blue and now I'm going to put down cerulean blue. I use a variety of brands. Uh, the brand doesn't matter to me that much uh, but um, I happen to have here a few brands like Winston Newton, Rembrandt, Vasari, maybe one or two others. I find that, uh, that the, the main thing you have to concern yourself with is the actual painting. Uh, now I'm going to put down some Viridian Green. And, um, and then I work my colors around so I go basically from dark to light. And, uh, and I also uh, have basically cool colors on this side and warm colors over here. You can see by the colors I already have on my palette what my arrangement is. 
that, uh, th th this color I use is something I've used only in recent years, which I like very much. By recent, I mean like ten, 10 years or so. And that is the cinnabar green medium. I find it's a very interesting color. I'll talk about a lot of these colors as I'm painting, so you'll understand why I'm using certain colors and the effect that they will have on what it is I'm painting. Okay, now this color is um, cadmium green light. Now, I, I put out smaller amounts and larger amounts depending on what I know I'm going to be using. Uh, of the earth colors, like the browns, I will put out um, a larger amount. For example, I use burnt umber at this point. I'm putting burnt umber down. I use quite a bit of that. And the next color I'm putting down is burnt sienna. And uh, then my next color is raw sienna. Uh, I, I enjoy using a French easel, by the way, uh, for small paintings. When I do larger paintings, I'll have a larger palette and a standing easel because in larger paintings, I need to get distance. Uh, whereas uh, for these small studies, I find the French easel very comfortable to use. And it's especially good if I'm going to paint in other places, like right now, for example, I'm not in my studio, so this is very comfortable to bring around and uh, work on a painting. So as you can see, I have all my paints here in the row below that's underneath in the back of the uh, easel, I have my brushes and rags. And I just put down some alizarin crimson. Some of the colors are cooler and warmer than each other. Uh, for example, the burnt umber is, I guess, uh, warmer than raw umber, but I don't use raw umber very much. I try not to use too many colors. Most of the colors that I get, that I use on the canvas, are colors that I mix. Uh, I don't really use r uh, pure color directly, because everything has to have a relationship. And if you use a pure color, it kind of stands out in a, um, a little too um, intensely. And then, and then I don't get a feeling of the... Um, of the form and the atmosphere. I'll explain more of this as I go in the process of painting. Um, let's see now. Now here is uh, cadmium, cadmium red light. I used to use um, different colors and I don't use them so much anymore. For example, I used to use uh, cobalt blue a lot, and now I don't use it much, so I've just eliminated it from my palette. Uh, I used um, uh, uh, yellow ochre more. Now I use very little, so you'll see I'll put down a very little bit of it. And uh, I, I, there was a time when I didn't use cadmium orange, and then I used a lot of it. And now I don't use it too much anymore. So, you know, things vary. People change. Artists change and their palettes change. And now I'm going to put down uh, cadmium yellow light. And I don't use too much of that either anymore. Okay, and now the last color, and probably the most important, is white. I use titanium white, and I put down quite a bit of it, more white than any other color, because I'm mixing white very often with a lot of colors. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, now I'm going to put my uh, medium, which is um, linseed oil. I used to use different mixtures, but now I just like to use the linseed oil if I want to uh, thin the paint as I'm painting and get a, a nice consistency. Or I'll just use it straight. The degree to which I'll mix the paint with the linseed oil depends on how thin I want it. And sometimes I'll even use turpentine to uh, thin the paint. But that's usually at the beginning when I start the painting, so it's more of a wash drawing. Okay, so I put the, turp they call it turpenoid now, it's turpenoid. Uh, turpentine is very smelly, and it's something that I used to use when I was a younger artist. Now the turpenoid I use for thinning the paint at the very beginning, and I also use it for um, uh, washing my brushes every now and then when I want to keep a brush cleaner, you know, for the moment. It's not my permanent way of washing. Now here I got some, some of the paint on here. I use this paper towel to wipe off some of the excess paint that, you know, is dried up around the caps of the tubes. All right, now I like to use a rag in one hand, and it's just a habit I've gotten into. So as I'm painting, I'll uh, dip my brush in the turpentine and then in the rag if I want to wipe it down a little bit. Now I'm going to use this neutral uh, dark color, which is the burnt umber. I'm mixing it with the turpentine. You can see how it becomes rather watery. And uh, now can you <laughs> tell me that? Okay, and now I have to set the model. Okay, and what I want to set the model for is a certain, uh, a certain pose, a certain design. Okay, and because I want to be sure that the design of her, of what I'm going to paint, goes well with this um, uh, surface, uh, or I mean the, the, the proportion of the uh, outside of it. Now this is more of a square, I probably should have had a, something a little more rectangular, but you know, with paintings uh, like this, if you like something, you can always cut it down on one side or another if you want to have a different proportion. So now I'm going to look at the model and I often measure to see the distances from top to bottom. And I see that uh, the distance from, let's say, the top uh, to the bottom. And the bottom is going to be about the bust line, below, below the, um, the cut of her dress. Okay, so that will be the bottom, so I know where that's going to go. Then I'm going to see, from this point down, uh, what that distance is of the chin to the hair and then go down to that bust line. So that's about halfway. So if let's say the bust line is like about down there, that means that I'll probably have her, hair, her head down to her chin about at this level. Now I'm going to see how I want to place the pose on the canvas. Now on the canvas I'm going to want to have, um, let's see now, I would say that half, the halfway line in the, for the middle of the canvas should be in a certain place. So if this is, let's say I'm going to put the, that over there, and I think I'll put it over here. You see, I change my mind every now and then, which is something you can do. And that's one of the things that is good about doing a wash drawing. Oh yes, I also want to mention that uh, I, I don't, I do this alla prima. This is alla prima painting. It's not where I'm doing a very careful pencil drawing first. And then after it's carefully drawn, then color in the areas. But I'm doing this more like um, a painting where I'm getting the larger shapes. I'm getting the larger shapes more like you would a piece of sculpture. When you do a piece of sculpture, you get the large shapes. 
I believe that artists like Rembrandt and uh, Sargent and others like that worked in the same manner. So, uh, you, and, and, and the point of this drawing is that you're always drawing. See, now here I'm assuming that the head is going to be something within that area. And I usually like a little more space on the side that she's facing. Also, I like the feeling of a uh, sense of atmosphere, so I don't, I, I don't like to crop the head, which is a more of a modern design approach to prevent the feeling of atmosphere and space and perspective. So when you crop a part of the head or other things off, it tends to look less spatial. And to me, that's an important characteristic that I personally like. All right, now, what I'm going to try and deal now with is getting the sense of design and proportion all together. Uh, so, and, and I'm looking for, you know, just getting the larger shapes. And in doing this, I, I am using a small, br a, a large brush. See, and I'm still keeping it so, uh, loose and uh, trying to just deal with, uh, don't turn your head, look, look in one way, that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to just get the major shapes that I see. Now, for example, the distance that I see from, let's say, the shade of the cheekbone to the back of the hair is about the same as from the cheekbone to the other side, uh, to the other cheek. And I can check it. In checking it, I would hold my brush, my arm stiff, straight, so that the proportion of all the measurements are the same, are, you know, in the same relationship. So I'm going to measure that distance with that distance, and I see that it is pretty much the same from here to here as from here to here. And now I can measure this too. All right, that's a little too short. So here I can make this out a little longer and a little shorter like that. And then when I measure this again, I see it's a little closer, maybe not enough. Now, the bottom line is not so much the measurement. The measurement is just a check. The main thing is that you have, uh, that you, you can see this by eye, so you get a more natural feel of what you're seeing. And I think in that process, you'll get a good sense of proportion, especially if you've done it a while, and if you haven't, you gotta rely a little more on the measurement. And I still do, you know, and I've been doing this for a long time. Okay, now I'm going to look for the center of the face. Okay, now the center of the face is not the end of the nose, but it's where the nose is resting on, and let's say the center of the mouth. So I know where the center of that relationship is. All right, now over here when I put in the hair, uh, apart from the shade, of the cheekbone, I can see how this is further out, you see, so that I can constantly check my proportions. Checking the proportions as you go is important, and in this way, I'm constantly checking these things and changing them, because I'm constantly observing and drawing. Uh, I usually uh, tell my students, that you, you have to paint what you see, uh, not what you know, because what you know are usually dogmas or rules that may apply to different situations. Whereas when you look at a life uh, presentation, person posing, there's a uniqueness about that quality that is different from everybody else. And even this uniqueness is, is um, different than if Phyllis were to take a different pose 
or the lighting would be different. So you always have that unique quality. And to me, that's what is so important in painting uh, from life. Now look, now you see here, I'm going to look for the major shapes and, and I'm also going to block in some of the main forms, like in a light wash. So for example, from the line of the shade on the hair going down, I get a general tone. And then over here, there is a tone that starts coming in at the temple towards where the eye would be. Uh, then I'm looking to see where the bottom of the nose is in relation to the face. Now, if this is the forehead and the, let's say, the shade is coming in here for the eye and this is the center of the face, then I think that the nose has to be, oh, probably about this distance down. Maybe it's a little higher. So I'm just uh, putting down guidelines for myself. All right, now I'm going to block in a little, uh, a little a bit of the shade of the nose just to see where that nose lines up. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put in a spot here for where I think the mouth is going to go. All right, now I'm going to try and get the rest of the design of the face and develop the drawing a little more, which means the shapes, and to some degree get into some of the secondary shapes. And don't be afraid when you're painting to uh, give yourself guidelines at times. The reason is that even when you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, shapes <clears throat> or, or light and shade, they all have uh, a particular shape to them. And sometimes if you have an indication by a guideline, you know where uh, that uh, shade goes. So over here, I have uh, a form of the shade going into the eye. Okay, here in the corner of the eye, there is another shade, you see, that is going down to the nose. Uh, and then down around the side here, I've got a little of the shade of the side of the face that starts the hair. All right, now I'm going to uh, indicate a little more of where the shapes are going. For example, the neck is going down from the chin. Now, in order to put the neck in, I have to see how it lines up with the rest of the face. If I make a straight line, which I can check out by looking or by holding my uh, brush up, I can see that this line of the neck is in line with the side of the mouth here and the edge of the nostril, so I know it's in the right place. Uh, then I see that the shade here comes down, you know, for the shade on the neck. All right, I'm not even bothering with the line of the jaw because I can hardly see it. Um, my father said, and his teacher once said to him, Hawthorne said, paint what you see, not what you know. And that's what I'm doing. And when you paint what you see, a lot of what you know is in the picture is implied. A lot of times people try to put in what they know and it looks awkward. For example, if I were to put in the line of the jaw, it would look awkward. But just by having the shades in the right place, the line of the jaw is implied and it looks more natural. Every now and then as I'm drawing, I start uh, moving a little bit in the direction of 
some colors. All right, now I'm going to see how far down the neck goes before I get to the shade uh, that is at about the collarbone. All right, now I'm going to measure that just to be sure. I think it's like that, but I want to just ch check it out, so I measure it. And I see that it's like about the distance of the chin to the bottom of the nose, something like this. So I look at that, and that's about right. Okay. Now, I know that the pit of the neck, you see, is below this line. And that's what I mean when I say everything is relative. Everything is compared to something else. When you paint one thing, you look at another thing in order to get the relationship. Now I'm going to look at the neckline of the sweater. So if this is the pit of the neck here, you see, and you can see where the shade is on uh, the bottom of the neck, and then the other um, bone comes this way, then uh, the, the sweater starts coming down for in, from, from this shade and I have to look at the distance from the neck. So I look at that distance, compare it to this distance, or compare it to other things, and I see that it's in the right proportion. And that's what makes it correct. That's what make the, makes the drawing correct at this stage. All right, now, we'll come down with that. I want to see how far down the, uh, the neckline comes on the dress. So I'm going to... Uh, check that out with other things, and I see that it's about this distance from the mouth down to there, and then that down to there. So it's approximately about that level. Okay, so I know that that's going to be the basic design of the, of the face and how that's going to go. Now, uh, sometimes you may want to correct things like this uh, light over here, maybe a little different, and you can, you know, wipe things out. Okay, now... I'm just indicating where, you know, some of the anatomy goes. Okay. Now, I'm going to start to block things in to develop the face. Um, sometimes I, uh, I'll use a bigger brush. Okay? I'm using a brush here that I like, which is... Uh, Actually, the brand is Raphael, uh, and it's uh, number four, and it's a filbert. But I like the feel of it, and I like the softness of it, and the way it can uh, take in a lot of paint or little paint. So it has a certain amount of flexibility. Now, I'm going to use a larger brush just to block in some basic tones. This is a number eight of the same kind of brush. 
All right, now, uh, I'm going to put in some of the tones in here, and to a large degree, uh, it doesn't look like much color, but it's very subtle. So I'm going to put in some green, uh, together with a little bit of my cadmium red deep, and just put that down for the time being. And uh, I may want to make that color a little warmer in the shade of the face and cooler in the shade of the hair. So I'm going to put in a little of cerulean blue, which I find comes in very handy for, for that kind of a mixture. Uh, it, it mixes up uh, the color so that I don't have an intensity the intensity that I want to build up would be in the lights, and uh, that I'll work out when I start using my lighter colors. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that, uh, there, to me, there's no such thing as skin color. But, as I said before, the color of the skin that you see varies with everybody and in every situation and in every uh, you know, a matter of light and shade. So, for example, the shade of her skin tone in this area, in the area of the face, is, a li is more like a gray, but a warm gray, especially as compared to the hair. So, I'm going to use a little more of the, of the burnt umber. You see, that's warmer than this cool tone. All right, now when the shade here comes down to the neck, it seems to be a little sharper. And then you get some in-between tones, but I'm not going to worry about that yet, because the in-between tones, or the subtleties, is something I'll develop as I go. All right, now, a similar tone to that is what I have on the shade of the nose. So I'm just using the same color that I mixed up. Now you can see how all of this is developing in a sense where proportion is very important. You know, if, I, if, if, this, were, if this were a little too wide or a little too narrow or too long or whatever, it's going to be wrong. So, and that when I say proportion, I'm really talking about basic drawing, basic shapes that you actually see, not that you make up based on an anatomy book. Of course, knowledge of anatomy helps a lot. But at this stage, we're trying to get the uniqueness of this person, and we're getting at it with the larger shapes and the basic tones first. All right, now, I'm still using the turpentine because I want to get it so that it will be more of a wash. And I'm still using my large brush, this uh, number eight. Now here, I'm just going to thin it, and because I just want to get a feeling of the tone, so um, I'm just moving out from that darker color. Because, so then I have a basis for the light of her face. And the light of her face, as you can see, is lighter than her hair in this section here. A lot of times people think, well, blonde hair, use yellow. That's not the case. It's not going to look very natural if you do that. All right, now I'm going to get, you see the hair in general is darker than the skin tones. Maybe some of the very light spots up here is similar, but even that is a little bit darker than the skin tones on the face. All right, now you see here I'm coming into the area of the eye, and it's more of a shade that goes over the eye there. 
And then on the other side, um, going develop the form, you see, of the eye as it goes into the temple. Now you have to understand that the eye is a sculptural form here where you have, uh, you know, the eye and the muscle over here uh, kind of protrude. And the docks around it is what, you know, helps create the shape of that form. Any details about the features and things like that will come after I have the major forms painted in. All right, now I'm going to come back to the number four brush and start developing some of the forms in the face. Okay, now I just used the cadmium red light, but you can see as it is, it's just too intense. So I'm going to subdue that with a little bit of the, uh, of the cerulean blue. And then I'll put this in temporary. See, even that is too light. So I'm just going to mix it into the darker browns that I have. And try and build that tone. Okay, now one of the characteristics I see on her is that there is a light form, for example, on the chin that gives a kind of protrusion. As you can see, the line of the cheek comes around and then you see the chin jutting slightly. Uh, then there is another characteristic of the mouth and this is really I'm dealing more with the anatomy, but as I see it on her. So, for example, I'll get into a tone and put in a little bit of the form around the bottom of the mouth area. You see, so that I can see this, uh, round, this sort of rounded ellipse of the whole mouth area. <clears throat> And you see, then it goes around up into the mustache area. See, and then I'll get some of the lights coming around on the other side. Now here I'm going to temper that red, you see, with a little of the cerulean grain. Not cerulean, um, cinnabar. Okay, I'm mixing up some of the red, just to put a touch of this down to know where the mouth is going to be. And now I see a shade for the bottom, the part of the nostril and a little of the shade underneath the nostril. Now, I'm not uh, differentiating at this point between the shade and the nose itself. All right, now I see that the tone of the nose practically blends into the cheek. So there is no outline for the front of the nose. I say it because I've been teaching a long time and I can't tell you how many students put in 
to the painting what they do not see. So for example, they will put in a harsh outline for the nose. And of course, you don't really see that because from where I'm sitting, the nose is practically blending into the cheek. And uh, then as you paint this without, you know, putting in uh, lines and things like that, you will know the form of the nose in the relation to the face itself. Now I'm going to go up and block in more of the upper part here. All right, now there's, there's uh, some lighter parts and um, some of that is not quite as dark or as red as the, let's say, the bottom of the nose. The bridge of the nose, for example, is a lot lighter, uh, just as the cheekbone here is a lot lighter than, let's say, the cheek in color especially. It's got more of the uh, gr green, light greenish touch. Now, I'm also going to line it up with the nose. Where does it go? You see, is it down here near the nostril? Is it higher up? The relationship is of all that is very important. So I see that more in line about here. So I know that that's where that cheekbone is going to be. All right, now I'm going to continue that across. Okay, and then I see also that there is a medium tone that is lighter than the side of the eye and is lighter than the corner of the eye and kind of goes in between from the muscle down around the front of the eye into this area here, you see. And then I'm going to come back and paint the secondary forms into that at a later stage. All right, now you can see already how this is beginning to evolve as a rounded form because the shade is here and the light is here. And yet even though the light is here, you see that this light, for example, is not the same as these other lights that may be lighter, but it's just uh, a little lighter than the shade itself. So all of that is what I call proportion, not only in size relationships, but in value relationships. All right, at this stage, I'm going to start putting in more of the tone around the forehead. Okay, now you see that's already too red at this stage even. So I'm going to tone it down. Okay, I got the cerulean blue. And I'm still using the turpentine. I'm not really getting into the thick paint yet. And at this stage, you know, sometimes uh, what I do is squint. And this way I see the major lights and darks. I, uh, and I avoid details so that I could see the, the larger shapes that are important. So that I see the forehead practically going into the light of the hair over here. And by the way, when I paint hair, I never paint strands of the hair because then it gets to look like straw and you do not get the texture. To get the texture of a hair, and her hair has a soft texture to it, you go against the grain and then occasionally you might make at a later stage a suggestion of a strand here or there. Okay, turn your face that way a bit. Yeah, good. A little bit. Good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Now I'm going to put in the light of her forehead. Now, of course, you know, when I mix it down on the palette, it's not right here on the canvas. When I put it down on the canvas, it may be a little different, and then I have to make adjustments so that I never know exactly what I have until I get it on the canvas. See, now, right now, that looks a little too, too um, intense, too, too light, too bright. So I'm going to cut it down. 
I cut it down by mixing some of the other colors, some of the green, into it. All right, now I'm going to go into some of the darker colors here. And I can do it just with some of the dirty colors that I have on my palette. All right, and now I have a little of that same tone coming around the bottom of the forehead. The, the, uh, to the, the form of this uh, part of the cheek uh, is going down, but it's also going across. And sometimes you need to have it go both ways. It also does another thing. When you go b uh, both ways, uh, that is horizontally here, uh, it tends to blend and pick up the softness of the dark edge. And that gives it a roundedness to the form. Now I'm going to block in some other parts over here and the hair. You know, so you'll be able to get a little better idea. And then put in suggestions of the background, because after all, when I'm working on the face, it all has to do with the environment, with the background. And the background right now is a little bit too light, because when I'm looking at Phyllis, I see a darker atmosphere back there than what I see on the color of, my, uh, of the surface of a panel. In fact, I'm going to start putting some of that in now. Okay, now you see that is a little too light for what I see in the background because I know I'm going to want to make uh, the light of her hair contrast a little bit with that background. Now, when I'm putting in a shade, like I'm doing in the background, it's a mixture. Uh, sure, I know the wall back there is basically white, but in the shade it doesn't look that way. In the shade it looks like a mixture of grays. So I'm using uh, blues and browns and white to get that gray. Now see here I've used uh, some of this uh, brown, but it's a little bit too warm. So I'm going to throw in some of the uh, cerulean blue. See, and then it cools that whole thing down a little more. Okay, and gives me a little more space and contrast with the lights on the face. See, so now when I put this in, I can see how there's a relationship between this background and the light of that face. So that the light of the face, uh, you know, uh, comes out at you much more. And you get uh, much more of a vital um, look. The illusion of space I'm getting by having a tone back here that is more neutral and recedes. It recedes because it's not intense. Intense colors jump out of the picture. They jump right at you. If I had a red back there, it would look more like a flat poster. But by having this gray tone, it's more like an atmosphere. You look at the paintings of the old masters, and that's exactly what they have. You look at Rembrandt paintings especially, and you see those toned backgrounds, and the face uh, has a uh, brilliance and a vitality, and also a roundness of form. Now I'm going to put in some of the light tones here. You know, uh, while I'm doing this, comes to mind uh, something that my father did. My father was a portrait painter, and he was painting a portrait of somebody, and a friend uh, came in and said, you know, he said, there's something wrong with the nose on that painting. And then the guy lay down on a studio couch to take a nap. So in the meanwhile, my father painted on the forehead. And when the guy got up from his nap, he looks at the painting and he said, you know, that's much better. He said, you should listen to me more often. Well, the moral of the story is 
my father painted on the forehead, which means it's the relationship to what was the problem perhaps on the nose. So a lot of times when students are telling me, I can't get the color to be lighter, how can I make the color look lighter? And of course the answer is that you had to make something else darker. And that is really the answer. You know, they start putting white and white, how much, how light can you make it? But it's the relationship that you have with the darker tones that makes that light. Now you see here, what I did is I went down over this just to go down over the light. And in the process, it softens it to give me a little, the beginning anyhow, a little more of that texture and form. Now here, for example, I'm getting a dark color uh, for the shade of the hair over here. And I'm just using burnt sienna and viridian green. You see, I mean, you know, and it's a question when you're putting down lights and darks to get the coloring right so that it really fits as well as the value. All right, I'm going to block in the uh, tones on the eye here so it defines uh, the bridge of the nose. Remember I said uh, one thing defines another. So this light on the bridge of the nose is defined by the shade on the eye over here. All right, and then um, just to get the feeling of the character, sometimes I'll put in a spot temporarily for the eye. See, and I see how that almost like blends in from the hair over here. But it seems like this light is a little wider, so I can either bring this out or I can bring in the shade on the other side of the bridge of the nose. Now you see before the hair was a little bit extended out and cast more of a shadow here. Now it's a little bit lighter because the hair is more flattened onto the muscle of the eye. So I have to decide which way I want to go. <laughs> it's okay. All right now. See Phyllis was going to try to adjust it because she heard what I said. All right, now over here, I'm going to get the feeling, you see, I want to get the feeling that the cheek is coming up and that it isn't so concave in this shape over here. So I'm getting a little of the cadmium red on my brush. All right, now that red, you see, is extending too far up. So right away, I'm going to get a cooler, dark, neutral tone to soften that. So you feel the atmosphere of the shade coming into the contour of the face. Okay, now I'm just going to play around with this tone over here. So uh, I'll get the, the basic form you know, that I, and, and it go, and there is sort of a half light tone over here. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, this light blends almost with the tone on the nose. Now sometimes I go back over things and alter things and change things. Okay, look, look the way you were looking before, yeah.
Now you see this light is a little too bright. So I'm going to subdue that. Subdue it means I'll just use some darker colors, other colors, and it'll subdue it. You see, like that. But I wanted to get this to be a little more extended up. Now you see the bridge of the nose, or just above the light of the bridge, there is a bit of a shade that starts the forehead. So I'm just going across, softening it. Now I, I think I'm going to try and get a little of the tone of the side of the nose here by just going over this area like that just to soften it, and then I'll come back to it later. All right, now uh, I'm going to try and fill up some of these other areas here, like for example, her eyes, the shape of the eyes seem much bigger. Uh, the shade here opens up into a larger space into the cheek from the nose. Okay, now what I'm doing now is adjusting some of the basic drawing that I have here that I feel is wrong. So, for example, I feel that her area of her eye is much bigger than I have it. So I'm making this higher and I'm making the bottom of the eye area a little lower. And her nostril is a little further out here. Okay, hold your mouth still. Thank you. All right, now I'm just using some of the red for the lips. And I'm just going to indicate it with a touch. So for example, I have a touch over there for the bottom lip, which reflects a certain amount of light. So that's just that. Uh, for the upper lip, I'll have a little bit of a darker area, but there are like three sections for the lip, the front and side of the upper lip is not as dark as, as the section further over to my right. Okay, and then there's um, that reddish part, it's half dark on the side. Now you see I'm still staying with the larger brush. I'm trying not to get involved with the small brush because um, if you get involved with the small brush you get into finicky details and, you, and it distracts you. You start getting details and you don't see the major forms, you know. It's like you can't see the forest for the trees or the leaves for the trees or whatever. Now the side of her mouth, you see, comes out a little wider here. And then you have the beginning of kind of a dimple or something that, though well, not a dimple, but it, <laughs> some kind of a fault that gives a certain amount of character and expression in your face. You know, which is just a mere suggestion on the side. Okay, now uh, I'm going to work up a little of the front of the chin 
as it gets a little bit lighter. Then there are some lights in here that I think I want to define a little bit more before I get involved in um, painting with the oil. Now you see here, for example, I have the same brush, and I guess I was too lazy just to mix up another color. But by going, it's lighter. By going light over here with my brush, see, I can get a general tone, and which, which serves the purpose of letting me understand that form. But in actuality, you see, it should be a little bit sharper. All right, now I'm going to try and block in uh, the rest of this area and then block in a little more of the rest of here and then start getting involved in developing the face a little more. Now I'm starting to use oil a little bit, uh, but um, I'm still going to go around and block in more of the outer part. See over here, there's a little of this um, sharpness here, from the shade as it comes down on the sun, on the jaw, and then it goes up on the side of the face. Now for the hair, I'm, gonna, I'm using a little bit of the um, cinnabar green and a little of the white uh, mixed with a few other darker colors that I have there just to get a feel of what the tone would be for the hair. All right, now maybe I need to get a little more into the darker tones of the hair because as a general shape, it contrasts a little more with the light of the skin. See, I'm mixing a lot of the green and the red to get this tone here, too much red. To get that tone of the hair. And you see, I'm, not, I'm going across the grain. For some reason, I feel it needs to be that way. I feel I, I get a form of the hair going across like that. And you can see how this tone like that relates to the skin tone better on the face because there is much more of a contrast. 
again, it's a matter of painting what you see in the relationships that you see up there. Like you know her hair is blonde, but you can't make it the usual yellow light that you normally think of as blonde hair. Otherwise it won't have a natural look. All right, now I'm thinking that I need to bring her chin out. I'm going to, I'm going to try and fix up some of the hair here first. Okay, I use the cadmium red light, I mean the cadmium green light, and a little of the raw sienna. And I'm starting to use more of the oil. See, just to get a basic tone there. Now you see, to avoid getting the sharp edges, the lines, I will go across this and then come back to it. For example, just by crossing that over like that, you see? And then I'll come back to define it better. Now I think my drawing is suffering here. You see, I feel that the chin and the cheek come out a little further in this area here, and so does the hair. So I'm going to have to adjust that. Okay, I'm making adjustments to the jaw and the bottom of the cheek here. And I feel it should extend out further than I have it. Okay, I think a major adjustment has to be made here. This is probably supposed to be a little wider than I have it. extending the top of her head, which I feel needs to be a little fuller. Okay, now to really make 
some of the shades a little darker, I've used some of the burnt umber with blue. And it seems like it's quite a bit higher than the line of the eyebrow, you see? So I need to correct that drawing. Okay. All right, as I said, I have to adjust the drawing, you see? And I made this line here for where the shade, turn your face that way a bit, yeah. You see the shade of her, fa of her hair, it comes up higher and it would cross about here, which means that all oh, this has to be a little higher too. But you see, the shade here is up there, and then that goes down like that. So you have this, ma this side of the face, you see, is much wider. Okay, now. And then I have the, the dark on the other side of her part is over there, so, and I have to see how it looks, you know. In other words, what is the drawing of it? Uh, I see that it extends to about just above the bridge of the nose here, so I can't go too far over. And then I have the light coming above. Now the light coming above on the top of her hair is a cool grayish tone. You see, it's more like that, as opposed to a warmer, more ochreish tone like you have on the light of her hair here where it picks up light. All right, that same cool tone seems to be over here too, of course with variations. And the variations are that you have a darker form crossing over here into from one dark area here into the other. And then here you have that darker form of the shade of her hair. I'm gonna use a little more of the blue and a little more of the um, burnt umber. Okay, now here you see, I see a separation between the hair and the shade on the neck. And it's more of a dark, but I have to be sure that it's in the right place in relation to the rest of the face. Okay, now, as I said, constantly adjusting the drawing and um, no matter how much you might finish something, it's always best to go back and adjust your drawing if need be. All right, now I'm going to uh, work on this area here uh, to get that light form, that basic form. And then as I said, I'm gonna block in more of the surrounding area. Okay, now I'm using the bigger brush and uh, I'm going to use a little more of the yellow ochre and uh, put in a little of these lights. Now when I look at that, I'm thinking this is too light, it's jumping out. So I'm gonna tone it down. Okay, I tone it down, it's wet. So when I tone it down with a little of a darker color, uh, it wouldn't become the color of the dark color, it'll become the, the mixture of this color of that against the wet. You know, when you put down a stroke, um, 
If you load your brush with paint and you put it down as one stroke, you'll have an intensity, strong color. If you put it down with two or three strokes, you lose the intensity a little bit and it becomes a little more subdued. So you have to decide what degree or lack of degree of intensity you want. And I'm basing it on basically what I see. All right, as I said before also, uh, the, the shape of the shadow of the hair, I'm lining up with the bridge of the nose. So I have things in proportion. Now you see, I see a warm tone over here, so I'm just putting down a spot. And I also see over here how it almost blends a little with the forehead. So I'm going to subdue that. And this is how I do that. I just go across the area here, you see. And that subdues it as opposed to a more uh, contrasting spot that I might have here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put the paint down and talk about the colors that I use. Uh, the, palette, the palette that I'm using is essentially the color layout that my father uh, taught me. Uh, he was a portrait painter who studied at the National Academy of Design in 1920. And, and he laid out a palette like this. He had some famous teachers there like uh, Hawthorne. My father would paint with this palette and this is essentially what I'm using now. Over the years I've changed colors and I also want to say that uh, different artists use different arrangements of colors. Uh, some even use only four colors, but I tend to use the full palette that uh, I have been using for a long time. So now I'm going to look at the model and I often measure to see the distances from top to bottom. I'm going to use a little of the alizarin crimson and viridian green. Now a lot of these mixtures are mixtures that most times people don't think of right away. And it takes, you know, usually a lot of experience to get an idea of what the colors are going to do. See, now right now that's a little too dull. It's got to be a little sharper. I'm going to put in some of the ultramarine blue along with the cadmium red. Now the upper part of, the, of this lip uh, tends to be a little more reddish. I mean, that's the nature of it and it gives it a more of a lifelike feel. There's also a slight, now I'm getting to real detail now, I shouldn't. There's a slight uh, feel of a, of a bit of a light highlight on the, on, the upper, on the lower lip here before it meets the upper one in this uh, section over here. Let me see if I can get that in. You see, these various little touches is what uh, gives the, the expression, for example, that she has in her mouth, that you can't get any other way unless you observe these things, you know, these little subtleties. So 
There's a bit of a shade coming down here. And I'm going to try and get that in. And then it comes from this cast shadow, it comes around like that. And over here I see a little bit of a streak. And you see how I've got the hair, the form of it, the dark's going across the grain. Every now and then you might want to put in a tone of a light that's coming in, but that's a little too light. I'm going to have to darken that. You see, you don't want it to jump out of place. It's got to be in relation to the rest of the painting. That was Legacy of an American Painter with Max Ginsburg, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get to know Max just a little bit. Before we begin, I just wanted to congratulate you on the exhibition of your work that was recently presented at the Salma Gundy Club in New York, and also the Butler Institute for American Art in Youngstown, Ohio. Fantastic stuff. You must be very proud of that and also of the publication that has just come out celebrating your career. Beautifully done. And uh, I really, I hope that not just the people who saw the exhibition, but all the people who see the book in the future will be waking up to your talent. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I wanted to begin by thinking about your training, about your coming up in the art world. Uh, certainly your father was a factor. Uh, because he was a working artist, uh, but also I'd like to hear about the schooling and how things were for you um, in Brooklyn and beyond. Yeah, my, uh, my history in terms of developing my painting technique uh, took over a period of time. Now, of course, when I was a kid, I saw my father working, mm -hmm. and that was a big influence. Whereas I think many people, artists, young students, didn't have this opportunity. All they saw was abstract yes. work being done. And uh, I think as a result, I had a leg up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, in trying to develop my skills, I didn't have any help from the schools I went to. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned music and art, which was the high school, yes. and Syracuse University, and City College. I went to all the three of these schools, and there was really nobody around. I guess the closest that anybody came was a sculptor at Syracuse named Ivan Mestrovich. Oh, yes. Who was a... Um, a major sculptor. Yeah, yeah a major important. sculptor, right. Yes. And he was an example of work that I thought was realistic and well done. Right. And now when I look at his work, having gone through realism of my own... Yes. I feel that there's a stylization uh -huh. in his work okay. that bothers me a little bit. Right. There is sort of a distortion. Yes. A little different, like for example, if I look at Michelangelo, who also stylized and distorted, mm -hmm. but that doesn't really bother me as mm -hmm. much. Sure. But still, it was an inspiration having somebody like that in school. That must have been amazing, in the yeah. same fine art department. Yeah, and he yeah. was sometimes called the Michelangelo of the 20th century. Very much right. so, yeah. Okay. And one of, one of the interesting things about him, in contrast to the other teachers, is that he couldn't speak English. Yes. So uh, either he spoke uh, Croatian yes. or he spoke Italian. And no. I didn't speak either of those. <laughs> uh, so he would just come over, push you away, take your knife. He would cut a piece of clay off, add a piece of clay. Mm -hmm while his cigarette was smoking <laughs> and the ashes were falling in his beard, but you never noticed it because his beard was gray and the ashes were gray. <laughs> Try that in a university <laughs> yeah. classroom today, huh? Yes. No smoking. <laughs> yeah. Well, but what an but, amazing but it experience. But it was inspirational. Yeah. On the other hand, I had teachers like one in figure drawing mm -hmm. where I expected I would learn something about figure drawing. He was trying to propagandize, and I say propagandize, mm -hmm. the class with a Matisse drawing. This is how to, how to draw the figure. Right. Now, this is not what I wanted. Yes. Again, I think I have to make a point, and that is that uh, I have no objection to people wanting to work like Matisse, mm -hmm. or even more abstract, 
that's their right. The thing that I am so upset about <clears throat> is that people who wanted to work realistically, like mm -hmm. I did, mm -hmm. did not have the opportunity. Yes. Because they eliminated people from, uh, you know, teaching yes. these courses, and people who had the skills began dying off. Right. Now, my father, for example, just 30 years earlier, this was 19, early 50s, 30 years earlier, my father went to National Academy mm -hmm. and was learning all this. Yes. But 30 years later, they had already made a change yes. in the art scene. That's what it took, 30 years. Yeah, yeah right. maybe even less in so certain places. So that yeah. was uh, the problem in developing your skill, my skills. Now, related to that would presumably be a lack of venues to exhibit your art. Am, am I right about that? Yes, that, absolutely. That, you know, if you're not going to teach <clears throat> that, and if people aren't necessarily wanting it, then the galleries are not going to be showing it. Yeah. Um, and so this leads very naturally into a conversation about your relationship with illustration, about working in the commercial world. I mean, did that more or less have to be because you needed to support yourself? Yeah. How, how did that work yeah. for you? I tried to work more realistically, but the galleries were more interested in either abstract work mm -hmm. or work that did not look, quote, old-fashioned. Right. Old-fashioned meant it was more realistically painted, mm -hmm. it was more rendered, uh, and, or let's put it simply that, or the drawing was correct. Yes. So uh, to be more contemporary, you had to show work that was called more creative. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, that simply meant bad drawing. Right. Of course, it was more than that, yep. because again, I have to state that I have no objection to people working in that other way. Mm -hmm. It's just that my way was deprived, and it wasn't just the artists who were deprived, but the public the was public. deprived yes. of seeing that kind of work, so their senses became dulled. Yes, that's how and it goes. This, this yeah. was a problem. Right. Uh, then, yep. then when in, um, in the 1960s, I connected with a gallery that was more sympathetic mm -hmm to my work, and I was uh, painting more impressionistically. You saw some of my early work in the exhibition. Yes. yes. You know, like uh, Rush Hour painting, or the painting of uh, um, a Park Bench, yes. a 61. Yeah. And that was uh, more roughly painted, mm -hmm. and but yet it had the basic ideas that I wanted. Mm -hmm. It's just that my skill to develop the painting was not that good. Uh -huh. okay. Now, of course, right. I put that those paintings in the show because I felt they were good enough. Absolutely. They There's a lot were. of work that was not so good right. that I got rid of. And I tell my students, get rid of your bad work mm -hmm. before too many people get to see it because yes. those were just stepping stones. Absolutely. Yep. But on the other hand, I want to be honest about showing the work that I did. Yeah which covers more territory right. than just the skill. That was very helpful yeah. to the exhibition viewers, for sure. But I yeah. must say that when I was teaching at Art and Design, the High School of Art and Design, I started uh, a morning group, or we called it the Old Hat Club, mm -hmm. mimicking the attitude of more of the, modern, of the modern art world towards what we were doing. They called it Old Hat. I see, yes. So my friend Greeny and I called it the Old Hat Club. So uh, we were painting more from life. And this was not done in the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was, as far as I, could, I knew, you know, to have a consistent program. The, uh, we couldn't do it during the curriculum because right. they didn't allow that. Not permitted. So we had students coming in who wanted to. It was all voluntary. Yes. Two hours before classes, painting from life, and they develop their skills, and some of them are very wonderful painters today. Well, we're talking about an underground movement here, really. Yeah. I mean, In that is fascinating was, yeah. to do it before and after yeah. hours. I'd love to know specifically who was participating in terms of who was actually in a teacher role and who was in a student role at that point. Do you recall? Uh, well, my friend Greeny and I, Erwin Greenberg, Yes. Uh, we were teachers in the school, right? And uh, we decided that we wanted to offer this as um, um, a teaching aid for students mm -hmm. uh, because they didn't have this opportunity. Right. So we had this uh, morning group or old hat club at 6:30 to 8:30, and the students would come in. We were not 
uh, simply teaching in the traditional right. way. Right. We were also painting, yes. but we would go around and help students mm -hmm. with their drawing and their painting. Uh, and uh, sometimes when we went around, the students would sometimes joke, because these are comments we would make, mm -hmm. oh, you're having trouble with your proportions. You know, as if that was the reason we there were going go. around. And sometimes it was, because we were not perfect. But what I want to show is that uh, as an artist, this was important for us to develop our skills. Mm -hmm. And by working every morning uh, for two hours from life, mm -hmm. uh, my painting became much better uh -huh. from a technical point of view right. in terms of skillful Just realism. going through the work. Yes. Absolutely. J you know, just yep. uh, observing people posing and yep. painting. Sure. Whereas before that, you're trying to conjure up uh, ideas or uh, you're thinking how people would look. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when I was doing that, my father was still around. Yes. I was also thinking of the way he would work and the comments that he would often make. Like he would say things to me like, um, paint what you see, mm -hmm. not what you know. Yes. And, uh, and, and I found this was very helpful because most people, if they see skin color, for example, they, fa they say, well, how do you paint skin mm -hmm. color? But that was not the answer. Right. The answer was that you paint the color and the values that you see right there. At that, at, on that situation. Absolutely. So as a result, we were getting the unique quality mm -hmm. of the image. Immediate. Yes. As opposed to a stereotype right. that was something that you just remembered right. and you just kept repeating that something same Something stylized, thing. yes. And many, peop many students still do that, mm -hmm. they do that. Yes. They, they can't get the hang of what it is they're looking at. Right. They're blinded by that stereotype. Now let's talk a bit about the gallery where you found some solace in the 60s. You said that there was a dealer who was helpful. Who was that? And why? There was a gallery called the Harbor Gallery. Okay. And they were out in Cold Spring Harbor uh -huh. on Long Island. Okay. And uh, they had uh, uh, some very interesting painters, mm -hmm. you know, painters who you see around today mm -hmm. who were, you know, some of the better realists. I remember uh, they had uh, occasionally they had people like uh, Ron Scher, yeah. um, uh, Nelson Shanks. Sure. Um, they had uh, occasionally they had uh, Bert Silverman, Dynastine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, there was um, who some of these others. Um, uh, Charles Fall, Chuck Fall. Yes, sure. Yeah, they had him. They had a number of painters huh. like that. But it's interesting that that's out there on the North Shore yeah. of Long Island as yeah. opposed to in yeah. downtown Manhattan. Yeah. Well, don't so, forget, that was in the 70s. No, right. And these guys, except maybe for, you know, Dynasty, who was somewhat known, right. uh, were not so known then. I see. Uh, Nelson Shanks was a young guy. Right. Ron Scher was even younger. Okay. So see, and it's about that And they were just coming moment. up. Yeah. When I saw his work there, I remember the gallery dealer told me, look at this, this work of a 19-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. Right. It was very good. Yes, indeed. Sure. Yeah. So now, in terms of working in the commercial world, uh, making illustrations, a lot of book publishing, magazines, and so on, um, that's running parallel to your fine art career, obviously, in terms of teaching and so on. Was there a lot of tension for you in terms of managing your time, raising a family, having a home life? I mean, how does that work exactly at that point in the 60s and 70s? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes to all of the above. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of tension. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you see, when I was teaching, it was six and a half hours a day. Right. And you had these Christmas vacations, mm -hmm. uh, spring vacations, summers off. Sure. Uh, weekends. Uh, I would come in and teach, mm -hmm. and in a way, my preparation or my homework was basically the work I did. Yes. I was painting. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, in that respect, it was better than when I was freelancing as an illustrator. Right. But th this was in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And um, by the way, uh, you asked before who were some of those uh, uh, students. Some of them were became rather famous. Mm -hmm. uh, one okay. of them, Steve Assell, 
Yes, he's very sure. famous today. Indeed, and he's a marvelous, uh, realistic painter. He is tremendous. And uh, another guy is Costa Vavayakas. Yes, and he's he's a uh, wonderful painter, very powerful, and a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, in the art students. Very distinguished scene. one. Yes. And uh, there were there were a number of others. Uh, there was one. Uh, not, some of them went into comic books mm -hmm. to make a living. Sure. Uh, one of them, a guy named Mark Texera, was a marvelous painter yeah. at that time. Uh, but he went into comic books, mm -hmm. and his skills began to change in a different direction. Um, but okay. Well, let, let me let me ask you though about this moment of distinguishing between fine art and illustration. I mean that. There are some people who look at your paintings today, things that you've made in the last 20 years, and say they are illustrative. That clearly this is someone who excelled at depicting things for a mass audience. I mean, the covers of these novels that you were uh, creating, for example, are immediately graspable. Everyone knows exactly what you're getting at. Uh, and ditto for your fine art today. We live in a world now that is populated by obscurism, the ironic, the hard to decode. So how does that play? We're talking about style here still, yeah. not so much your subject matter, but the notion of is your work ever accused in your experience of being too transparent, too mass, if you will? How does that feel? Yeah, I think sometimes people, even in, uh, in articles that the reviews that people have written even recently, uh, they say that uh, I'm very clear mm -hmm. and I'm very straightforward in what I'm painting. Mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't seem to be a puzzle as okay. to what it is I'm saying. Right. And I think this may be, uh, this may have to do with my expression or what it is I'm saying, mm -hmm. but it's also the way I am painting. Right. So the painting that I'm doing uh, be, and painting it realistically is very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and, and I used to joke a little bit when I did illustration that it seems to me that in illustration there's a straightforwardness mm -hmm. when you're illustrating. Absolutely, totally. Whereas fine art has become, maybe it has been for quite some time, ambiguous. Well, The message is not always that clear and you can take it in many directions. It seems to have become yeah. more that way yeah. lately, but yeah. I would argue that, think of the symbolists. Uh, working in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they were certainly obscure. They were not trying to tell a conventional story. They were hinting at mysticism or spirituality or inner life. Um, has there ever been a phase in your career where you went down that road, where you can point to a moment where you were doing things that were not so readily legible? Um, I, I really don't know. I can't think yeah. of an example, but yeah. maybe there's a yeah. moment. Yeah, I can't think of an example either. Okay. But oh. sometimes it comes out that way mm -hmm. because the the eye of the beholder is not always what you're thinking. <laughs> you can't control that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And I mean, one of the uh, outstanding examples of that recently has been uh, an essay that some student wrote in Mississippi about my painting, War Pieta. Oh, okay. And uh, the head of the school asked me if they could print an image of that painting. Mm -hmm. I said, sure. Well, and then I asked him to do me a favor and send me the essay. Mm -hmm. And he sent me the essay and I couldn't believe it was the same painting. Oh. Because their take on the whole thing was ah. a little different. Right, well, perception. I mean, I yeah. had done it as an anti-war painting. Right, right. And the student mainly thought of it as the bravery of this guy who gave his life yes. dying for his country. I see. So yes. it's quite a different story. Totally different. Well, there yeah. we are. It's yeah. a free society yeah. and we can make of things what we will. That's right. Well, let's yeah. let's shift just a bit then to subject matter. That That's yeah. a beautiful be, segue. Be, before you come to that, okay. I just want to say okay. that when I was working at the High School of Art and Design, mm -hmm. I had put in 21 years of teaching. Sure. And I submitted a painting to the Society of Illustrators. It actually was a painting that you saw in the exhibition of uh, my student, Costa Vavayakis. Yes, yes. And uh, that was done back then in 1979. Mm -hmm. I put this into the, into the, into the um, Society of Illustrators in one of their annual shows. Mm -hmm. And an art director came along and saw it. And he liked it, but he happened to have been a classmate of mine uh. 
back in high school and junior high school. Sure. Haven't yeah. seen him for 30 years. Right. Yeah. So he called me up and said, would you like to do illustration? Mm -hmm. So that's how I started to do illustration. Okay. So I stopped teaching and I started to do illustration and then I felt, this is wonderful. It's freelancing. I'll have more time to do my own painting. Yes. Just the opposite. <laughs> I had more time when I was teaching, right. because as I mentioned, the I breaks. had those yep. uh, breaks, yep. the summers, and, so, and then the evenings. Here, everything I'm doing was money. Yes. So, the, and they would throw a lot of work at me. I'm sure they did. So I kept working and working <laughs> and working. And of course, there were some times when I didn't get much work, but you know, between greed and insecurity, you yeah. can go crazy. You created a gilded cage for yourself. I'm sure it <laughs> yes. was very tempting to yes. take the next job. I still did yeah. my fine art, yeah. but you know, I, I was busy with this or I was yeah. worried about getting other work or right. more work. Right. And then the money aspect started going to my head. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was one of the problems doing illustration, but well, the money was nice, it but, made a lot more money. But I'm going to be very blunt now for a minute though, was there a moment during that phase of your career where certain dealers or critics or collectors wouldn't even speak to you because you were tainting your hands with mere lucre? I mean, was that yeah. a factor for a while or could yeah. you run a parallel career yeah. Yeah. with galleries? I think, it, I think it was a factor okay. because especially then I think there were many uh, gallery dealers who felt that it would taint your work yeah. and people would think you're not a serious fine artist. Right. Yeah, and well, this, was, this was a mistake. And uh, that's why there was a time I didn't even sign my name to right. the illustrations. Yes. Part of not signing my name was because I didn't feel that was 100% of my expression. Right. I felt that as an artist, it's not just how you paint something, but what you paint. Indeed. That's a part of what you are and what you're saying. Yep. So I didn't sign my name for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, at first I did, and then I didn't, and I would sign it a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> but then when I started to have these public venues, mm -hmm. I felt it was very important for me to show a variety of the work I did over these years. Mm -hmm. And part of it was the fact that I did illustration and that I had to do that in order to make a living. Exactly. And you've talked very eloquently in other yeah. settings about this unfairness, the fact yeah. that realism was locked out of the party yeah. in the mid-20th century for all sorts of complicated reasons. Yeah, well, the realism that was locked out, though, wasn't just in the technique. Yes. You see, in terms of the illustration, I yep. felt yep. it was locked out in terms of having something of substance mm -hmm. that really reflected life. Yes. Uh, most of the illustration was a form of escapism. Sure, right. And that's not what I really felt I was about. Yep. But I compromised in that respect mm -hmm. for the money. But I was very proud of the quality of the work I Outstanding did. Outstanding work, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Now let's, Sorry. that's a great segue. Yeah. Sorry. A great segue in terms of the beginnings of your awareness of yeah. real people, yeah. average people. You've spoken to me earlier about your mother organizing a union yes. and so on. Can we talk a bit about that? That's going right back yeah, to the 30s, isn't it? Yeah, that's back in the it? 30s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's when, uh, those were the depression days, and my father did not get work, so my mother paid the rent because she had a job as a pharmacist in a hospital. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were, she and her friend, a pharmacist, were trying to organize a union. And sometimes, and this was part of my background education, uh, there were union meetings held in my living room. Mm -hmm. So I would hear what's going Perfect. on. And uh, so this was part of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I lived with my grandparents, you know, in one, in one apartment. Wow. And we even had to rent out rooms to boarders. Yes. Because those were hard times. A very common yeah. scenario at that yeah. time, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. I mean, this awareness that life can be tough, that yeah. the middle or yeah. the working class yeah. have a tough time, yeah. not just in the depression, but yeah. always. Yeah. Um, how does that roll out then in your work thereafter? I mean, as you're coming up, um, this 
uh, illustration scene was deeply uninterested in that, presumably. The, there were very few opportunities for you to show people in the street begging, for example, and get paid by a publisher to, to do that. What made you want to do those images then on your own steam, on your own dime? I think it was basically my background education. Mm -hmm. And when I say education, I don't mean just in school. I mean the influence that my parents had in terms of their political attitude towards what's fair, mm -hmm. what they felt was democratic and undemocratic. It was uh, the, the feeling that, or the education that I had mm -hmm. in relation to the injustices that existed in the world. Mm -hmm. As a Jew, I mm -hmm. felt a certain amount of anti-Semitism in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. uh, as a kid, I was growing up with the fear that Hitler yes. was winning for a time yes. in Europe, and he was killing Jews. Yes. And I felt vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Whoa, my God, what would happen if he won and came over right. to New York? Absolutely. You know? Uh, a real concern. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, that yeah. would be a real problem. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that there was a fear that I mm -hmm. had. But this was a part of my feeling about, um, you know, um, fighting for justice mm -hmm. and I saw these this kind of discrimination also happening in in New York now yes. some people might have felt differently for example even though I'm not black mm -hmm. I saw this kind of discrimination against black yes. people yes this was a part of the whole scene yes it was of what is right and wrong yeah. I saw black guys who were in the war or coming back to the states mm -hmm and how to face Jim Crow situations yes. Yes. in the South. Yes. Couldn't use the same restaurants, couldn't mm -hmm. use the same bathrooms. Yep. The German prisoners who we were fighting had those opportunities. Right. Exactly. Not fair. I mean, this right. was the crazy situation. And indeed, so that's 1945 yeah. and onward. Yeah. And so we all know the arc yeah. of social justice yeah. that was unrolling yeah, right. uh, through the 50s and 60s, right. culminating, of course, right. with civil rights, but going beyond uh -huh. that. Can I, uh, let me say ultimately. something else about yeah. that. Yeah. Remember we were talking in the car coming down here, and I was talking about the, 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 the influence of um, social realism mm -hmm. in art. Yes. And we would, I was talking about the 19th century painters. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I wrote down these notes. Good. Uh, <laughs> because I would remember them. You know, I mean, people like Lermite, mm -hmm. Lapage, Bouveret, uh, Degas, Yes. Millet, they painted working people. They did. They painted people in active situations. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were others, uh, Peter Croyer. Yes. Uh, um, Anders Zorn, mm -hmm. you know, painted uh, one painting, Our Daily Bread, mm -hmm. or other scenes where they're painting people in factories. W one of them was painting a, what is it now? Peter Croy, painted, I saw a painting of a sardine factory. Yes. And here he's painting these people. With now, respect. When I think today of the attitude of realists mm -hmm. towards this subject matter, it's like I feel what's happening? Here we're, we call ourselves living in a democratic society and we're afra either afraid mm -hmm. to deal with these subjects or we want to be pure yes. and be above reality. Looking and this at aesthetic gets me. beauty yeah. in a pure way. Yeah. Let's talk about that though. Here, here, you are such a lucky man in many ways because you have lived long enough to see the revival of interest in realism among artists, yeah. among dealers, collectors, museum curators, and so on. It's happening every day and it's thrilling to behold. Thinking about, let's say, 1990 onward, let's mark it with the real renaissance of ateliers that, that one by one around the country uh, in almost every major city mm. we find an atelier opening. You are not necessarily involved in those personally although you're aware of some of them very very closely. Um, they've been training generations of 20-somethings to paint well, to draw well, to do things that you didn't have a chance to do yourself when you were training. But um, isn't it true that very often they've been encouraged to make still lifes of beautiful flowers or landscapes of untouched wilderness or scenes of Italy 
that look like they could have been painted 150 years ago. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that most of those artists have not been encouraged to paint people begging on the streets of New York or Detroit? Well, I might give you a different answer than they would. Okay. You know. Let's have yours. Uh, yep. Well, first of all, I feel that in that movement there is a, uh, a theory of art or a um, aesthetic that raises up the ideals of classical beauty yes. or the early Greek and Roman beauty. And that seems to be the basic concept that they go with. And I think the French Academy was probably their inspiration. Mm -hmm. And there were many painters who painted along those lines mm -hmm. in the 19th century. You know, so the neoclassicism, yes. and in a way, this is a form of it. It is indeed. Yeah, and, yep. but I must say that even though they are limited to what they feel is universal and pure, mm -hmm. uh, I feel a little differently about mm -hmm. that, but I have to say, that I respect and admire what they have done. Yes. Because even though it's still a drop in the bucket, I feel that they have promoted realism mm -hmm. among the population mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that more people are beginning to see and appreciate realistic art. Yes. You well, know, the and key I think there, that's wonderful. it seems from where yeah. I sit, is to make sure that yeah. your work and work yeah. like yours yeah. is seen alongside right. those classically right. beautiful images so that yeah. people understand there are different subject matters that can be explored not with the same techniques. Not only alongside their work, mm -hmm. but alongside the majority of the work, mm -hmm. such as installations, yes. abstract expressionism or whatever. Sure, yes. Even though I don't agree with that work, I feel they have every right to show it, yeah. just like I should have. Totally. And I think yeah. that the museums tend to, uh, to discriminate and mm -hmm. eliminate that from what they feel is contemporary art. Because I feel contemporary art is what the public right. responds to. Yes. And when I saw the reaction of people in the Butler Institute, the way they responded to my paintings I think that is contemporary. Yes. Now, may, now, here's where I differ a little bit with, with the, uh, the atelier approach or the classical uh, universality. Uh, I feel that that contemporary quality that I have in my work is what people really respond to. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really think they respond to the abstract isms mm -hmm. or the modernisms. Mm -hmm. I think the only reason they do is because there's a lot of money behind it yes. and people respond to something, oh, if there's a lot of money behind it, that means it's great Indeed. art. Indeed, yes. Or they, they respond to it because they have been educated or I guess some people would say brainwashed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to believe this is beautiful art. Yes. And people do become conditioned. Absolutely. Yeah. It's human nature. So this is right. this is how I feel about that. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> I I I think that that the the realism that I'm trying to get uh, seems to be taking hold more if I have public venues. Yes. Because obviously people are not going to want to buy a painter of a homeless person or a beggar and put it in their living mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. or even an anti-war painting. Mm -hmm. But there is place for this in public venues. Absolutely. And this is why I, I do that. But I feel there should be some opportunity to paint these things just like there was in the 19th century. For sure. You know, where, did they have more freedom? To do this? Not at all. Of course, I understand there were people who were very influential. I mean, writers like Zola right. and Tolstoy yes. that made a big There was a zeitgeist difference. of yeah. that. Yes, indeed. I mean, Repin's work yes. was just amazing. You know that painting Repin did of the religious procession? Yes. My God, when you look at that, you know, the class consciousness mm -hmm. in that. Very Unbelievable. Yep. The police are beating these, yep. sur these serfs, uh, and these serfs are carrying these religious yep. symbols. Yep. And the, uh, these upper middle class people are walking so smug. Yeah, I mean, exactly. the, no, that the, juxtaposition the is, so clear. is incredibly yeah. dramatic yes. and clear. Let's circle back yeah. to the Repin procession picture that you were referring to before. Maybe we could hear a little bit more about what that picture has meant to you and how it influenced work 
of your own. Mm -hmm. Well, it influenced uh, the Peace March painting that I did. Uh, although I must say, in that painting, Repin, I think, uh, did a better job at, uh, at organizing his composition. Uh, there was uh, much more of a homogeneous quality. Now, it could be that maybe he used, uh, he did it from life, although they did have photographs then, and there may, there may have been many people who used photographs. I know that Bouveret used photographs and many others did. Yes. But um, it's possible. But I think he just did a masterful job in that. You see, now when I did this Peace March painting, I used photographs. I stood at a Peace March back in 1965 or 6, and it was going down Broadway, and I was taking a lot of photographs. And then I selected out of about 100 photographs, uh, about 10 that had various figures that I wanted to use. Mm -hmm. So I just took them out and put them in place and did a whole um, um, uh, draw. I did a sketch first. Right. And then I, uh, I made a uh, grid and scaled it to the size of the painting. Now, but let's talk about photography yeah. for a minute. Then. Yeah, is there an that. element of yeah. cheating yeah. there? I mean, that is a big issue in the world of realist yes. art these days. What do yes. you think? Yeah, I think there is. I think artists used for photographs some time ago. I mean, I know I've seen, you know, pictures that who was it, Homer or was it Eakins, that used photographs. Absolutely, it goes but, right back to the but beginning. But in, re in recent in recent years, especially during the modern art age it became like a dirty word to use photographs and you knew that many artists were using photographs and when they heard a knock on the door they would hide the photographs <laughs> <laughs> so people wouldn't see them including me probably uh, but uh, as far as photographs are concerned there was uh, a time when I did hardly used photographs in the 60s and 70s uh, there were times I took snapshots of things, details in the street, but usually I didn't, it was all from life. But when I started doing illustration, the way of doing them was to do a photo shoot. Yes. So we would hire models. And of course, these were not models that I would normally see on the street. These were usually some, you know, good looking uh, people who usually were waspy or Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> Why? Sure. from various areas who were considered white and beautiful right. because this is what sold covers. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and then we, we would have them pose, you know, uh, in a photo shoot uh, with costumes and there would be a photographer taking pictures and we'd spend about an hour doing this and then I would go through the photographs and pick out the ones I wanted mm -hmm. to use, make layouts, then the art director would say they like this or that, and then I would proceed to do the painting. But in doing that, you see, we used the photographs and traced. We traced the images Interesting. onto the board. I see. And this is the way it was done. Now, many artists did that, right? including, for example, uh, I think Norman Rockwell. Yes, indeed. When he would Most use definitely. the photographs. This is how they were done. That has been proven. Yeah. Now, did that become very comfortable then, that way of working? I mean, it sounds it became, good. It became comfortable because no. it paid well, no. and it was much easier and quicker to get the results. Sure, yes. Even though it may not have always been the best, and to a degree, I would say, that it weakened my ability to observe. Yes. Because when I observe from life, I really have to observe more carefully. But wouldn't you agree that we can spot a book cover created by someone who worked only from photographs all his or her career versus one of your covers yeah. where clearly you've been looking at live models all your career? Yeah. That there's a depth yeah. there. That I think differs. so. I think you can in most cases. Yeah. I think there are some cases, and I can think of some illustrators who really drew beautifully. At least that's how it appeared to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way they painted it or colored it in seemed also pretty good. Not quite like I did, like a full painting, but there were similarities. Mm -hmm. There were some pretty good illustrators. There were some bad ones, too. The use of photographs has uh, good points and bad points. And uh, when, I was, when I finished illustration in 2000, although I kept doing it in 2004, 
I started to use photographs in order to photograph real reality in the street. Whereas up until then, I was just using the photographs uh, as illustration. That was just um, for the illustration selling of books or the, for those uh, purposes. And uh, I felt, well, this would be good. This is what I wanted to do. But uh, I found that while it helped me to get images that were the real people, the real choreography, uh, real details and background, which you could not get in your studio. I felt that it really helped me to get that okay. reality. Yeah. Uh, so I began to work a number of illustrations that way. Now I think a lot of them, uh, a lot of people like, but they tend to look very photographic uh -huh. and apparently it bothers some people. Okay. Now from my point of view, I felt that in some cases it lacks depth. In other cases, I think uh, it has uh, a more convincing quality. Okay. For example, there is that uh, painting I did of a homeless person, or another one called Crossroads, where it has a certain amount of depth. Some of the hot dog stands, and I think that those are good. But then there are some that are just too too slavishly copied okay. from the photograph. I see. But in the process of that, I began again working more from life. Mm -hmm. And in working more from life, I began to feel the magic of working from life because you get a more whole, a more total form. Indeed, completely. You don't have the real choreography, you gotta make it up. Yes. Uh, and uh, you don't have the real people. Right. Or they are posed. So this is a, it becomes a trade-off. Well, there are trade-offs yeah. everywhere in now our that, making. That bus stop painting that I did uh, has people uh, posing basically, but to do that I made sketches and I also took photographs of people waiting at a bus stop. Yes. But then I got people to pose here in my studio with this lighting and that made a big difference. Good. You felt a fuller uh, feeling of atmosphere and the sculpture of the forms. Yes. You know, so to that degree, it was better, you know. Is this something that you will carry on with then? This mixing so. of your techniques, I, your methods? I think I will carry it on, but I really want to work more from life. Okay. Part of it is that I'm better at painting than I am at photography. Sure. And when I work at photography, uh, it doesn't always come out as good as I want it to. Okay. So maybe if I was a better photographer, it would be a different story. That may know. be. Yeah. Well, that leads me to wonder which picture you're most proud of these days. I mean, it's hard to pick one. I know yeah. that's like choosing a favorite child. But in terms of where you've been in the last 10 years artistically, yeah. how are you feeling? Uh, well, I think that bus stop is a kind of culmination mm -hmm. that I did in 2010. Uh, and the reason is that I did a good amount of it from life. Some of it I did not do from life. I started it from life, but the people couldn't pose. Mm -hmm. Like the man holding the child. Yes. The child couldn't pose, so I painted that. There were some other figures in the painting that also couldn't pose that well or for a long period of time. So to some degree, I used the photograph to help me. But essentially, I, I painted that from life, and I had, the, but the people standing here in this light was able to give me that enveloping form. Right. You know, I say enveloping so it doesn't look flat. But let's talk as well about the subject matter. What is it about the bus stop motif that appeals to you? The thing that appeals to me is that it's more New York that I see. It's more personal. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, says something about what I've done for so long. Even back in the 60s and 70s when I was exhibiting this kind of work, I was painting the New York that I know, mm -hmm. which is really the people that sure. I see. Absolutely. And uh, in the environment, whether the subway, on the street, and so on. Uh, so here, uh, I've kind of encompassed the whole thing again, but I think it has the advantage of the lighting 
that I wanted. And yes. who knows, maybe I haven't just gotten older, maybe I got a little better. I think you might, actually. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, so but, that, that's a part of it. But I want to say something else, unless you want to. Please, no, okay. go, go right ahead. Uh, I want to say that there are some themes that are important to me. And this deals with justice and injustice. Now, even though I have paintings of beggars, and there's a beggar in the bus stop painting, mm -hmm. And that is saying something about a condition of life, which is the human condition mm -hmm. that I'm concerned about in all of my paintings. Mm -hmm. All of my street scenes are not just street scenes as decoration. Right. They are paintings about the human condition. Uh, and in some of them, you, you, know, you, you, you sort of, you, you don't have an answer for exactly. Right. I mean, for example, I know I'm getting off the track, but no, I'll come back to No, not at all, not at other. all. Uh, for example, there is the one that I call Nannies and Kids. Yes. Now, here is a painting I did from photographs, but here is a, a black woman who is a nanny taking care of white kids. Mm -hmm. And you see this all the time. This is a condition of life that you see. It is indeed. Okay. Yeah. Now, who knows whether it's, uh, it's mainly white people who are well-to-do and people of color who are poorer, which is a fact. Mm -hmm. but, the f f but the fact is that these... This is the situation. It's a situation. And yeah. this has been going on forever. Sure. This has been going on for slavery. Well, you had the same black people taking care of white people's kids. But you and I have talked about Jean Barreau, the 19th century French yes. painter, who also depicted city scenes, yes. mostly Paris, where there were these various classes all yes. living side by side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is a human theme. That's Very right. Very definitely. Yeah. So it's a universal theme. It is universal, and you are capturing our times yeah. for us. Yeah. Now, would you agree, however, that a lot of people in the art world today, whether they're collectors or critics or curators, are anxious about documenting our time in paint? There are plenty of photographs out there being exhibited and sold, showing us as us. But what about painting? How does that feel? Well, I think painting is a different medium. It is. I think people enjoy painting as painting and uh, just like they'll enjoy any form of art. But I think even though this is a visual image, like a photograph, I think it's another medium. I and agree. I think that people will enjoy it for that reason. There's also a personal expression that comes into play, mm -hmm. whether it's the handling of the paint or the way it just comes out. You can't always even um, direct, you know, everything that you're thinking or every stroke you're doing you know, exactly. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is intu intuitive. Totally. You know, yes. and uh, this is a part of it. And it would be a mistake, of course, to suggest that a fine art photographer is just holding the box and pressing snap. Uh, yeah, we right, all understand that the way the photographer lines things up has a great deal to do with yes. his or her vision and yes. um, what they're trying to say. Nonetheless, I think that it's so much easier, wouldn't you agree, to sell a painting of a landscape today than it is to sell a painting of people waiting for the bus. Oh, definitely. And sure. why is that? Is that because people are conditioned to think of painting as something beautiful, quote yeah. marks around that word, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as opposed to something tough or real? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think that people usually want decoration as a form of escape. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't seem to want to uh, hang problems on their wall. Indeed. Yep. And uh, yep. that's a part of it. That's right. But you see, I think there is an aesthetic with many people where they feel just hanging something nice uh, isn't really as meaningful artistically. And I think that there are people who have a deeper sense of what art should be, that speaking the truth has a beauty, and not, not evading or escaping <laughs> from it has a beauty, and that is the aspect of John Keats. this kind of a... You have quoted right. John Keats, <laughs> absolutely. Right, yeah. Truth yeah. is beauty, yes. Yeah. There you are, very interesting. And yeah. maybe yeah. we live possibly in a society that doesn't like to deal with toughness yeah. Um, yeah. in fine art. I, you can turn on the television any day you want and watch a train wreck, that, that's not the problem, but that is a particular format of delivery of yeah, that image. Right. Right. Uh, a car crash or a plane going down. Uh, but what about painting it? Is that something that's swimming against the well, tide, perhaps? you know, it's, it's interesting uh, how people can become conditioned. Uh, like, you see so many people who have torture scenes hanging in their homes. And, of course, I'm talking of 
the crucifixion of Christ. Absolutely. But if if I bring it if I bring it into today's world of people getting tortured, they can't take it. Mm -hmm. This painting is difficult for people to take. Yes. So it's almost like the other painting, the other thing becomes some other strange animal. Yes. You know, and yet, you know, you hear people in various forms of art expressing ideas about this. Yes. In fact, when we even see a movie, if the movie is innocuous, you know, if it's, there's no conflict, if there's nothing, it's boring. What about filmmaking? Wouldn't you agree that films are where most of our society comes to look together at visual imagery? That most people don't go to museums or galleries at all. They go to the movies. Yeah, right. And I'm not trying to be classist or yeah. city versus country. Yeah. How do they affect you? How does your thinking about imagery relate? To oh, it affects me a lot. I see, um, I see all kinds of imagery in movies uh, that um, I wish I had the opportunity to have those props <laughs> at my disposal. <laughs> you know, but. You know, uh, uh, movies command a lot more uh, attention and a lot more money, uh, so they can afford those things. Yes. I guess this is similar to some of the 19th century painters mm -hmm. who painted for the, uh, what, the military in France, for example. Absolutely. Uh, who are these, these two French... Uh, Detaille would be an yeah, example right. of someone painting battle scenes. And Messonnier also. Right? Totally, yes. Yeah. Well, this and is pre-film, of yeah. course. They were creating right. images for right. the people because there was no film. And they had at their disposal yep. all this stuff totally. that now only Warner Brothers or Metrical Mayor has. Amen. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Let, let's talk, though, about where you want to go next. Um, in your work, what's on your easel? where would you like to be in a year well, when what it comes I'm, to subjects what been, or style? You, you've noticed what I've been doing are uh, a lot of paintings uh, where <clears throat> I'm dealing with some of the um, prime issues of today like war or like torture and uh, or like um, um, what's that when people lose their home foreclosure yes Yes, yeah. very topical. Yeah, yeah. And uh, these are issues that are foremost, you know, uh, on people's minds. Mm -hmm. These are what I would say are contemporary issues, mm -hmm. and this certainly certainly can be part of contemporary art. And I think if artists who are more abstract want to use these issues, mm -hmm. fine. But I think there should not be any reason that realists cannot attack these issues. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the only thing I can think of is that when realists paint these issues, it is more effective, it is more communicative, so that people who don't want to speak about these issues, who want to hide the truth, will object to it. Yes, yes, okay, that's interesting. Yes, that this is a, a social construct. Yeah. That we've got. Yeah, well, that's yeah. what I, yeah. I I feel that there are people who may not want you to right. speak about this, you know. And I've gotten flack mm -hmm. for this painting over here, right. Torture Abu Ghraib uh, specifically. I'm sure you have definitely. Now it's a tough there's picture. a painting where I I used the uh, models. Yes. The people posed. It's, it's only the dog yeah. that didn't pose. Right. The dog was not cooperative. <laughs> so yeah. I used one of the photographs from Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Also, he was kind of scroungy, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. It's hard to find a scroungy dog Yeah, who would, uh, who would cooperate. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, though, just thinking about the notion of trying to be of our time, but also not too topical, that it becomes dated quickly, if you see my point. Um, why is it that Goya or Colvitz cross the centuries in immediacy but other works look dated, boring. You had to know what was going on that year in the newspapers. Can you think about that for a minute? And I'm not yeah, saying yeah. any of your pictures yeah, are yeah, troubled know, by I that know, issue, but what does what an artist coming up in the world need to pay attention to? Yeah, well, you know, it could be that some of their works were dated, so-called dated, because they were not popular during that time. Okay. I mean, yeah. like, uh, you know, Bouguereau, he couldn't give his work away 50, yeah. 60 years ago. For sure, yes. Now he's popular again. Right. Not that he's doing my kind of painting, 
uh, to some degree, I admire what he's done. You know, he's a fantastic uh, artist. Incredible. Uh, of course, and I, I saw an exhibition of his once at this um, Athenaeum in, yes. in Hartford. Absolutely. And I was amazed at the, the, the degree of subjects that he had there. It wasn't only, you know, the cute little girls carrying babies. Right. You know, but he really had other situations. He had a whole career. Other things, In yeah. different styles yeah. and yeah. concerns. But you knew that's how we made a living. Yes. From these particular the kinds of subjects. that are best known. Yeah. 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 And just like when I spoke about the social realists of the 19th century, I'm sure many of them did uh, salon paintings that people wanted to buy and hang in their homes. Very definitely. One yeah. question that I've been wondering about with you is your take on photorealism. What did you think of Richard Estes, for example? Well, uh, his work is, very, is astounding. You know, when you look at it, you're really amazed. When I looked closer, I saw that he really didn't, couldn't paint figures. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they were just terrible. And, and then I began to see that, uh, you know, he was really not painting the subject, he was copying the photograph. Yes. Now that is a big difference Quite. between me and a photorealist. I'm painting the subject and the photograph is an aid, yeah. you know, a, a scrap reference yes. to help me paint the subject Quite. so that uh, I'm not interested in just doing that. Now the interesting thing is there were photorealists who would say they're not painting realism, they're painting the photographs. Absolutely. As if it's a dirty word to paint realism. Bingo. But you're painting the photographs, so then it became justified in their mind or maybe in the minds of the, the contemporary art experts, end quote. Thank you. This is why I wanted to raise it, because I oh. think anyone who looks at the yeah. arc of your career yeah. might be forgiven for saying, hey, wait a minute, this was addressed by the photorealists. Why yeah. are we talking about Max Ginsburg? Yeah. Where's Richard Estes? But yeah. no, no, no. He would admit that it was all about the photograph. It was yeah. not about the material yeah. Yeah. behind the yeah. lens. But you know, I think, I think that a lot of people, artists, uh, are, not, are not just one or the other. You know, there's a lot of gray matter in between. Totally. And I think that even among many photorealists, they get into the subject to some degree, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's true. You yeah. know, and uh, well. just like uh, there are many uh, realists who will use the scrap reference, like I certainly will, mm -hmm. you know, because it will help me achieve my purpose. With a talented artist like Richard Estes or Audrey Flack, yeah. nothing is going to be accidental. They didn't get to be celebrated just because they lucked yeah. into a lucky snapshot. There yeah. was an element of forethought, of course. Yeah. I don't mean to diminish their achievement at all. Yeah. But what I am getting at is that there's a difference here. You're more or less of the same generation, and yet yeah. you I have am. a very different project. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, you know, it could be that uh, uh, I wasn't smart enough, or I didn't network enough, or I didn't have political savvy to know the right gallery dealers or to schmooze with the right people. You know, um, I don't know what it is, you know. Well, well. You know, uh, I, I, I must tell you that uh, uh, one day I was riding in my car, what was it, about uh, a few months ago, and I got a call from this guy, Eric Rhodes. And he said, I'd like to do a DVD of you. And of course, you know, and my, my wife and my children were witness. They were in the car. I hope you pulled car. over. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And of course, you know, I was delighted. I, but I was really thinking of doing a DVD, and I had inquired with some other people. Yeah. Well, it's serendipity, yeah. but it's also a tribute to the fact that you have stuck to your guns. Yeah. And I think yeah. that what Eric has been doing with yeah. Fine Art Connoisseur and his other publications is trying to put this story in front of more and more people. Yeah. Not yeah. just your story, yeah. but the story of all yeah. the talented artists no, I appreciate that. of different yeah. ages who are sticking yeah. to their guns. I want to say something else about technique. We were raising it a little before between the, uh, the ateliers that have a basic French academic approach and my approach. My approach is more uh, uh, a, la, a, la, a la prima. Yes. 
Uh, and I would say that there were strong influences there. I mean, there are artists today who work that way. This guy I mentioned, Steve Assel, is that way. Uh, LaFell. Yes. Um, what's his name? Uh, Schmidt. You know, a lot of these top realists work this way. Not all of them do, but a lot of them do. And, and then there are even some who work in the atelier, who I would say are very good, you know, who have the same sensibility. You know, some don't. They get very stiff and awkward. Well, the key know? then is to yeah. encourage those yeah. good ones to carry yeah. on and maybe branch out of right. studio motifs right. into the real world. But I want to say something else, and that is that when I look at three artists of the past, I see this basic approach where you come in with a big brush, you get the basic forms, and you work in building on those forms towards the smaller forms or details. Starting with Rembrandt, uh, Sargent, and Soroya. Yes. Now, their subject matter is quite different. I mean, when I look at Soroya's work, I identify totally. Of course. Because he is painting people and there's depth of these earthy great people. Example. Great example. Sargent is painting portraits, but even his paintings of the people in Venice, you feel don't have the same kind of power right. that you would, or depth that you would see, let's say, in, uh, in a Soraya. Indeed. And then when you go to Rembrandt, you see the brutal honesty. Brutal. Which is wonderful. Absolutely terrific. You know, and that Timeless. is... Truth is beauty. Yes. Well, there we go. And, yeah. and that idea that one doesn't really care when that sitter lived. Yeah. It is a person with us today. Oh, yeah. Whatever yeah. they may be wearing. It's absolutely right. of all time. And, that's right. you know, I think that's where I was getting at with the dating question, the element of what comes through as universal and what feels of its period. Not that it's not worthy, but that it is somehow finite in its appeal in its power. Well, I think, I think if you have a human message, it's universal. I agree. You know, and, but I think the specifics enable you to get at uh, this u universal message in a more convincing, real way. You know, because here, let's say, for example, I'm painting a painting of you. You're a specific person, the way you look, you dress. You know, this is a particular individual, the lighting, everything is, is you. Yet it's universal because there's some connection or similarity sure. between you and many, many other people. It's humanity. Even though you're so unique. Yes. But that uniqueness is important. Yeah. Otherwise it becomes just a boring stereotype. Exactly. No, very well put. Very eloquent as usual, Max. <laughs> Max, let me ask you about how you would like to be remembered. That's a very morbid sounding question, but it's not meant to be. I think every artist surely thinks on this, even at the age of 22 or 28. Um, it's very difficult to speak about how I want to be remembered because it sounds a little obnoxious and That's egotistical, okay. so I'm not going to speak that way. Uh, but uh, one of the things about legacy is I'm just wondering which paintings will be around. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if I have a storage problem. Uh, who's going to deal with them? Or maybe uh, we'll just burn them or give them away. I, hope I mean, what do you do when you have a lot of paintings? Like if I do a lot of paintings like torture, Abu Ghraib, and some museum doesn't pick it up, what do I do? <laughs> Good no, question. Nobody wants to hang that in their living room. <laughs> Very good question. But you see, I think it's important for me as an artist and for society to have these things around. I agree. Yeah. You know, so in terms of legacy, of course, I would want this kind of recognition, the social realism. I would also want that social realism might, uh, you know, become a more important part of the art scene so that uh, people begin to understand that art that deals with reality, with real life, is a part of art. That art is not only uh, pure or some abstract entity.
That makes perfect sense, absolutely, that it is part of a continuum yeah. and that yeah. this has to be addressed every generation yeah. to matter. Yes, that's a very important legacy and I think it's one that's on track. Bravo. Thank you. Well, that was Max Ginsburg from the video Legacy of an American Painter. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching today. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put the paint down and talk about the colors that I use. Uh, the, palette, the palette that I'm using is essentially the color layout that my father uh, taught me. Uh, he was a portrait painter who studied at the National Academy of Design in 1920. And, and he laid out a palette like this. He had some famous teachers there, like uh, Hawthorne. My father would paint with this palette, and this is essentially what I'm using now. Over the years, I've changed colors. And I also want to say that uh, different artists use different arrangements of colors. Uh, some even use only four colors, but I tend to use the full palette that uh, I have been using for a long time. So now I'm going to look at the model and I often measure to see the distances from top to bottom. So I'm going to use a little of the alizarin crimson and viridian green. Now a lot of these mixtures are mixtures that most times people don't think of right away. And it takes, you know, usually a lot of experience to get an idea of what the colors are going to do. See, now right now that's a little too dull. It's got to be a little sharper. I'm going to put in some of the ultramarine blue along with the cadmium red. Now the upper part of, the, of this lip uh, tends to be a little more reddish. Yeah, that's the nature of it, and it gives it a more of a lifelike feel. There's also a slight, now I'm getting to real detail now, I shouldn't. There's a slight uh, feel of a, of a bit of a light highlight on the, on, the upper, on the lower lip here before it meets the upper one in this uh, section over here. Let me see if I can get that in. You see, these various little touches is what uh, gives the, the expression, for example, that she has in her mouth, that you can't get any other way unless you observe these things, you know, these little subtleties. There's a little bit of a shade coming down here. And I'm going to try and get that in. And then it comes from this cast shadow, it comes around like that. And over here I see a little bit of a streak. And you see how I've got the hair, the form of it, the dark's going across the grain. Every now and then you might want to put in a tone of a light that's coming in, but that's a little too light. I'm going to have to darken that. You see, you don't want it to jump out of place. It's got to be in relation to the rest of the painting. <laughs> 